Good morning. We welcome this new day of this new year. We've received with a song, hymn number 38 in your gray hymnal, Morning Has Broken, which was originally published in 1931 and composed in the Scottish island, providing an opportunity for the community to give thanks for a new day. Please make sure that your microphone at home is muted and sing along enthusiastically from wherever you are. congregation of Gwinnett. My name is Lydia Patrick, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Joanne Weiss is our worship associate this morning, and it is a joy to be with you as we make room for intentional change this morning. If you have a chalice at home to light with me in a few minutes, please go ahead and have it ready. We arrive from many places and many life experiences as we gather to recall our true selves, reflect on the meaning of our lives, and explore questions of ultimacy together. We are people who are new to Unitarian Universalism and people who are lifelong Unitarian Universalists. We are people of many religious beliefs and spiritual practices. We affirm and promote the responsible search for truth and meaning. We are people of many genders, sexualities, ethnicities, origins, ages, shapes, sizes, and expressions of our true selves. We affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of all people. We are people of all ages and family structures, and we each bring gifts, talents, and passions that serve to affirm and promote communities with peace, liberty, and justice for everyone. We are people of covenant who engage with one another in ways that promote and affirm justice, equity, and compassion in human relations. We are people who care deeply for our planet and understand that we are inextricably and profoundly connected with the web of all existence. We are people who welcome all who are seeking a community of faith that welcomes your whole self, all that you are, all that you were, and all that you yearn to be. You are just where you should be. In a virtual room full of compassionate, thoughtful Unitarian Universalists ready to meet you where you are. You are welcome. You are home. If you are a newcomer this morning, we welcome you and hope that you will indeed find your spiritual home and journey here with us. We are becoming a radically welcoming sanctuary in a green space. We foster spiritual growth as we joyfully nurture connections and community within our walls and beyond. If this is your first time here, I encourage you to come back, join us several times, experience the full flavor of this congregation and this faith tradition, especially when we start meeting again in person. I encourage you to come, be with us, be curious, courageous, and compassionate. Let's take a deep breath. Bring our awareness to becoming more fully present to this time that we have set aside to be together. Breathe deeply. Breathe deeply. 
As sound vibrates through us and around us, may we be reminded of how deeply and profoundly interconnected we are with one another. May we set our intention on all humanity, all beings, all living things, and all the stars in the cosmos. Our opening words come to us this morning from Amy Lloyd, Intentions and Trust. Today, I want to greet joy without a trace of suspicion. I want to open my eyes to the light without a blink of dread. I want to look at my past without a whisper of shame. I want to look at my future without a hint of fear. Today, I want to dance without pausing to think. I want to belly laugh without caring who hears. I want to open my arms and twirl in the sun until I fall breathless. Free to be myself, full of joy that I open to allow, completely letting go. Without even a smudge of suspicion or a wink of hesitation, that's my intention. That's what I want. Our chalice lighting this morning comes to us from Lois Van Leer. It's entitled, On the Brink of an Intentional New Year. We light this chalice on the brink of a new year, letting go of what has been open and hopeful for what may come, renewed, restored, ready to live life fully anew. May we move forward with intention. And now I think it's time for our wonder box. I'm going to ask Joanne to open it for me since she's so much closer than I am. Go, let's go for it. <gasps> What is that? Oh my gosh, what is that? Open that up. Oh, that is Millie's new blankie that she got for Christmas from Beer and Wes. Oh, she loves it. That was in her bed this morning. Oh, well, what else is in there? Oh, that's Millie's adventure toy. And it looks like it has a, something in there. Is that one of her teething chews? That, oh, it's a dental chew. That keeps her breath minty and fresh. Minty and fresh. Wow, how did that get in there? Oh, you know what? I know why. That's because today's Wonder Box is all about life with Millie. I was not ready for another dog. For the last 38 years, we had, give or take, three children and eight fur babies in and out of the house. With retirement, I was expecting some anonymity and extended hours for self-reflection and thought. What if there is a dog out there that needs a forever home? Bob asked. We have never not had a dog, Bob stated. You might be lonely at home by yourself during the day, Bob hinted. It can't hurt to look, Bob said, and we might be able to give a good home to an animal that needs one, Bob suggested. And there, was my downfall, my undoing, my restart, my looking outside of what I currently wanted to what I knew was the right thing to do and what I needed to do. Well, that's what I told myself. Lois Van Leer for Chalice Lighting for a Service December 31st last year said this, we light this chalice on the brink of a new year, letting go of what has been open and hopeful for what may come, renewed, restored, ready to live life fully anew. May we move forward with intention. 
With regard to Ginger Crisp, now Millie, this is what I would have said on December 29th, 2019, our gotcha day. We rescue this hound on the brink of a new year, helping her let go of what has been, showing her hope for what may come, renewed, restored, ready to live life fully anew. May we help her move forward with intention. When Millie was 11 weeks old, we got her from the Society of Humane Friends of Georgia. They found her and her siblings on the side of the road. Mom was a hound and Dad was nowhere to be found. She was the runt of a large litter and was regularly attacked by her siblings and her mother. During mealtimes, they chewed on her and they wouldn't let her eat. She was removed from the litter shortly after they were rescued from the side of the road. Some of the scars on her ears are so deep, they will never grow back together. She was really one scared little puppy. Our intent was to help her find peace and love in her forever home. We renamed her Millie because of her calm and unassuming nature. Like chamomile tea, we thought. Millie. We quickly learned that her calm and quiet nature was mostly because she was just terrified. She came to us with several infections and was on meds for a month, which required us to gather her poop, bag it, and toss it so it would not be absorbed into the ground in the backyard and spread. As unpleasant as that was, it was a constant reminder of the work that still needed to be done. She stayed in her crate all the time even though we never closed and locked her in it. She only poked out far enough to eat and then retreated back in. If we got her out of the crate to clean it, she went under the table or behind the couch. It was weeks before we could get her to come out of the crate on her own for any reason. We always had to reach in and get her. We loved her. We gave her bruised ears special attention and gentle pets. It was clear to us that she needed lot more, lots more time to feel safe and find her own place with us. And when she did finally come out, we celebrated. Another one? On the other hand, some of it was just regular puppy stuff. Navigating the deck steps, going to and from the backyard, feeling safe to walk around on her own, inside and outside, navigating a walk in the neighborhood, introducing her to family members and toys. We knew though from the very start that she needed time and space to feel that sense of belonging and being wanted. And we worked intentionally to give her just that. We read books about it. We watched videos about humane and fair ways to navigate home life with a rescue. We didn't make her like us. We didn't raise our voices and said no. We corrected with redirection and distraction and rewarded small victories. We gave her a schedule. We took her out every hour on the hour and we praised her all the time. We didn't fly off the handle when she did puppy things like chew up a pillow or pull on her leash. We approached her quietly and calmly. We gave her a few safe places to retreat within the house so that wherever we were, if she needed to enclose herself for a bit without getting too lonely, she could. Her crate is her number one spot. She also likes the back stairwell. She has a pallet on the landing and a big bed in our bedroom. When strangers are in the house, she moves to the back stairwell. When the weather is bad, she goes to her bed upstairs. If the TV is too loud, she moves to the landing. Her number one safe retreat, though, is always her crate. We've seen subtle changes over time. She has started to enjoy the backyard and wander about, wonder what's happening on the other side of the fence. She comes to sit for, get it for a treat. She goes for short car rides and she loves 
absolutely loves Funny Bones Doggy Daycare. Sometimes with her, it's two steps forward and one step backward, but at the end of the day, she's ours. She fills our hearts. The kids, all adults now and on their own, and some of them with their own fur babies, say that I love her more than I did them. It is not that. They always have my heart. But with Millie, I knew up front what her struggles would be and prepared myself for intentionally helping her face them, overcome old hurts, and helping her feel <clears throat> like she had found a forever home. And I believe that in some pretty distinctive ways, she has helped me understand the reality of needing to be aware of those struggles in others as well. Because fear resides in all of us, and living with intention does not exclude that, but often requires facing it head on. What I have learned from these past two years with Millie is that sometimes helping someone else find their intention, their peace, their place of calm, their purpose is what gives meaning to mine. Please sing with us now hymn number 23, Bring Many Names. In his discussion of this hymn, the author, Brian Wren, said, if the human race is created in the image and likeness of God, it follows that both femaleness and maleness reveal the divine. And since we are not static, but having a changing life cycle, both young and age also give the glimpse of God. I love the new year. Yes, the days are short and the weather can be cold, wet, and downright miserable. The trees are bare, the birds are quiet. The celebrations of December are behind us and I breathe a sigh of relief. I look at my calendar for 2022, mostly empty at this point, and I compare it to my 2021 calendar so densely packed with nearly daily obligations. What commitments, meetings and, meetings, and appointments will fill up my day in this new year? What trips will I take? What books will I read? How will I spend my time with others, with my husband, my grown children, my aging mother, and my dear friends? And what about the unexpected and the unplanned? The symptoms and then the diagnosis, the call from a loved one with bad news, 
a careless trip over a curb that can leave one broken and bruised. It's all an open book, and I'm ready to meet it head on. For many of us, and I suspect some of you, there is the age-old tradition of making New Year's resolutions. I say age-old as this tradition is thought to have begun with the ancient Babylonians some 4,000 years ago. They were the first to hold recorded celebrations in honor of the new year, though for them, the new year began not in January, but in mid-March when the crops were planted. They also made promises to the gods to pay their debts and return any objects that they had borrowed. These promises could be considered the forerunner of our New Year's resolutions. If the Babylonians kept their word, their gods would bestow favor on them for the coming year. If not, they would fall out of the gods' favor, a place that no one wanted to be. Fast forward a few millennium in early Christians, the first day of the new year became the traditional occasion of thinking about one's past mistakes and resolving to do better in the future. In 1740, the English clergyman John Wesley, founder of what would become the Methodist Church, created the Covenant Renewal Service, most commonly held on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. Also known as Watch Night, they included readings from scripture and hymn singing, served as a, which served as a spiritual alternative to the raucous celebrations normally, had, normally held to celebrate the coming of the new year. Despite the tradition's religious roots, New Year's resolutions today are mostly a secular practice. Instead of making promises to the gods, most people make resolutions only to themselves and focus purely on self-improvement, which may explain why such resolutions seem so hard to follow through on. According to the website statisticbrain.com, as many as 45% of Americans make New Year's resolutions, but only 8% are, are actually successful in, in achieving their goals. But that dismal record probably won't stop people from making resolutions anytime soon. After all, we've had about 4,000 years of practice. Now, I know that we have all made, had experience in terms of making New Year's resolutions because it is the American way, and goal making fits right into the capitalist way of thinking. However, as an older adult, I abandoned this practice long ago, mostly because it didn't work. In writing this, this reflection, I quickly Googled top 10 New Year's resolutions, and what I found is about what one would expect. Exercise more, lose weight, get organized, learn a new skill or a hobby, live life to the fullest, save more money, spend less money, quit something, fill in the blank, smoking, drinking, checking your phone every five minutes, spend more time with family and friends, travel more, and read more. I would bet that every person that is listening to this service has aspired to accomplish at least one of these things at some point in his or her or their life, whether it's because of a New Year's resolution or just a realization that something in their life needs to change. Of course, resolutions can be downright funny too, such as, I will watch more cute kitten videos on YouTube. I will stop writing emails to my spouse. I will, buy worth, I will stop buying worthless junk on eBay. I will save money for a rainy day, that way I can shop online rather than going to a real store. And my personal favorite funny resolution, I will not buy anything from Amazon for a whole year. <laughs> no, not going to happen. <laughs> but in all seriousness, why is it that so few Americans are not able to keep their New Year's resolutions? Well, there's plenty of advice on that as well. Going back to GoSkillsGot.com, the website suggests that one should, number one, mentally prepare for change, number two, Set a resolution that motivates you. 
Number three, limit the number of resolutions to a manageable amount. Number four, be smart, specific, manageable, attainable, relevant, and time sensitive. Number five, break up that resolution into smaller goals. Number six, write down your goals. Number seven, share your resolution with others. Number eight, perhaps my favorite, automate if possible using Google calendars and reminders. Number nine, review your resolution periodically. And number 10, if you fall off track, then get back on quick. Rome wasn't built in a day. So, is it any wonder why so many people fail at New Year's resolutions? In an article by Philip Moffat entitled The Heart's Intention, the author suggests that perhaps we should be setting intentions and that setting intention is not the same as making goals. Understanding the difference can lead to more skillful living and less suffering. In the article, Moffat states that goal making is indeed a valuable skill. It involves envisioning a future outcome in the world or in your behavior, then planning, applying discipline, and working hard to achieve it. You organize your time and energy based on your goals. You commit and visualize those goals. Goals are an imagined future and not concerned with the present. And that's the rub. Goals are an imagined future and not concerned with the present. In contrast, setting an intention according to Buddhist teachings is quite different than goal making. It is not oriented toward a future outcome, but rather than being in the present moment. And by being ever present, you understand what matters most to you and make a commitment to align your actions with your inner values. Goals can help you make your place in the world and be a more effective person, but being grounded in intention is what provides integrity and unity in your life. And ironically, by being in touch and acting from your true intentions, you become more effective in reaching your goals than when you act from wants and insecurities. Just imagine what it would be like if you didn't measure the success of your life just by what you get and don't get, but gave equal or even greater priority to how aligned you are with your deepest values. Moffat continues that goals are rooted in Maya, illusion, the illusionary world where what you want seems fixed and unchanging, but in truth is forever changing. And it is in this world that Mara, the inner voice of temptation and discouragement, flourishes. Goals never fulfill you in an ongoing way. They either beget another goal or they simply collapse. Goals provide excitement, the ups and downs of life, but intention is what provides you with self-respect and peace of mind. Cultivating right intention does not mean you abandon goals. You still continue to have them, but they exist within a larger context of meaning that offers the possibility of peace beyond the fluctuations of goal setting that brings pain and pleasure, gain and loss. In choosing to live with right intention, you are not giving up on achievement or a better life, but rather you are connecting it with your own internal dignity. Standing on the ground of intention, you are able to participate as you choose in life's contests, but with the foundation of knowing who you are. You will still feel insecurity, pain, sadness, and difficult emotions, but you are not the victim, and your happiness and peace of mind are not dependent on how things are right now. Of course, there is still much more to be said about right intention versus goals, but I think that this is enough to ponder for now. 
As I begin the new year and inevitably set a few goals, at least in my own mind, I hope to be less attached to the outcome, knowing that I'm grounded in my beliefs and values in the present. And now join us in singing Gather Around the Christmas Tree. Or the choir. The choir is going to be singing. Thank you. Gifts of love for everyone. Hosanna in the highest, indeed. Thank you. In my description for this service, I said, in order to greet joy without a trace of suspicion, we've got to know what we are about. Looking forward sometimes means coming to terms with the present and saying goodbye to the past. In the Wonder Box, I talked about my intention to make a forever home for Millie. I also said that over the last 38 years, give or take, we had eight fur babies make their home with us. I can't say in all honesty that my intention was the same for any of them. I am not sure in all truth if I had any intentional plans with them other than to have great pets to love and help the children learn about responsibility and kindness. Bob used to say that I could walk in the front door without even taking a step and smell an accident and identify which dog had done it and which room it had happened in. That was the extent of my intention. I felt like many years with, those chil with our children and those pets all growing up together. Bob grew up with pets. My family had one childhood pet that I remember in the traces of my early years, and I was the youngest of four children. She was a Heinz 57, if you will. When I see photos of her, she looks like a mix of some kind of Australian Shepherd and a Collie, some kind of breed in between those two. One summer, my dad said that she had gone away. Her name was Pudgy, Pudgy Wudgy Walskajolski. He was probably saying that to me to try to save me from the pain of her death, as I'm sure she was already very old before I was old enough to know and love her. I think there may be one or two photos of me with her, and that's it. 
And after that, the circumstances in our household changed such that having and caring for pets successfully was just not possible. I share that to let you know that this web of dignity, empathy for others, and compassion was something that I had to grow into and claim for my own. The spirituality of my childhood was not one of compassion and community, but of sharing the truth of God's word and admonishing sinners of their errant ways and offering to pray them back to the cross. I grew up to be kind and obedient above everything else, not necessarily fun-loving and truly compassionate for the suffering of anybody else. Leslie Jameson says that empathy isn't just something that happens to us, a meteor shower of synapses is firing across the brain. It's a choice that we make to pay attention, to extend ourselves. It's made of exertion, that dowdier cousin of impulse. Sometimes we care for another because we know we should or because it's asked for, but that doesn't make our caring hollow. The act of choosing simply means we've committed ourselves to a set of behaviors greater than the sum of our individual inclinations. This, con this confession of effort chafes against the notion that empathy should always arise unbidden, that genuine means the same thing as unwilled, that intentionality is the enemy of love. But, the author states, I believe in intention and I believe in work. I believe in waking up in the middle of the night and packing our bags and leaving our worst selves for our better ones. In Joanne's reflection, she talked about the difference between setting intentions and making goals. Goals can be part of a checklist and once done, checked off the list. Whereas intentions require you to be to be present for what you intend to do. She said, in choosing to live with intention, you are not giving up on your goals, but more connecting them with the foundation of who you are. Your intentions connect you to what you believe. And that, I think, gives them power and deeper meaning for each of us. Deepak Chopra says, conscious change is brought about by the two qualities inherent in consciousness, intention and attention. I'll say that again, intention and attention. Whatever you put your attention on will go stronger in your life. And whatever you take your attention away from will wither, disintegrate, and disappear. So what I would suggest for us today, and I think that everyone around would agree, that we put our attention on our intentions. As I prepare to do a service, I always pray for openness, for fresh inspirations and insights, and a deeper meaning for my own life as I share my journey with this beloved community. So yesterday, this quote from Neil Gaiman showed up on my Instagram feed as part of what I, a group that I follow called Whispers of Positivity. The quote is called, Positively Present. I hope that in this year to come, you make mistakes. Because if you are making mistakes, then you are making new things, trying new things, learning, living, pushing yourself, changing yourself, changing your world. You're doing things you've never done before. And more importantly, you're doing something. So what are our intentions? As part of this community, I would love to see each of us set an intention to be more present in our circle of love. We are small in numbers, this is true, and we are trying to stay afloat in an ongoing pandemic. This is also true. There isn't a group or committee in our wider circle that is not in need of some membership and participation. Yet, I dare say we are all members of something. 
in this community. And I am here to give an unapologetic plug for the worship committee. We need service leaders. We need worship associates. We need more lovely voices in the choir, of which I'm also a member. We need to hear you. We need to reflect on your journey, listen to your stories, hear about what you read and listen to and where you draw your inspiration from. And as I look out over the tech team, whose names are given in gratitude every week for the very hard work and minute details they pay attention to so that you can see and hear us right now, we're trying to make our budget through our pledges. We are trying to maintain a green space and a welcoming community for every single individual who connects with us. We need folks committed to religious education, social justice, and small covenant groups. These are the groups that I can remember and name off of because these are the ones that I hear most often at the meetings that I attend. But this is not the complete list for sure. The work of this church does not happen without us. Any board member can testify to that. And even, even as I say these words, I know, I know that we are all serving one or more committees already. I know that we are all stretched. I know that we are all at capacity on the edge of so many things right now. And so this community continues as best as it can with love and commitment with open communication, with covenant, treating everyone with dignity and respect and seeing the best in each of us. So today is really, really not about signing up for something. It's not. We have tried this morning with the readings, the reflection, the music, to discover opportunities that allow each of us to reflect on our lives, including the histories where we came from, the present days of our comings and our goings, and looking into our future. At the end of my Wonder Box about life with Millie, I said that for me, sometimes making an intention, an intention to help someone or something outside of myself gives my own life deeper meaning. I think also that the energy of just setting an intention at all takes us to a deeper place in the universe, just that one step in that direction. Maybe this is all that I know so far. Can we each set our attention on letting go of what has been, open and hopeful for what may come, renewed, restored, ready to live life anew as we move forward with intention.
now we take a few moments of space to think about our intentions and our prayers for this morning. The prayers of compassion today come to us from Vanessa Southern. She is the author of the Unitarian Universalist Association's meditation manual called This Piece of Eden. And I would like to add a response to our prayers this morning with the words, even this is enough. Let's practice it together one time. Together we say, even this is enough. So much undone, so much to do, so much to heal in us and the world. Together we say, even this is enough. So much to acquire, a meal, a healthy body, a fit one, a lover, a job, a better job, proof we have and are enough just around the corner of now. Together we say, even this is enough. And up against it, the reality of all that falls short in the limits of today, we honor the limits. If, if your body won't do what it used to, for now, let it be enough. If your mind won't stop racing or can't think of the word, let it be enough. If you are here utterly alone and in despair, be all that here with us. Together we say, even this is enough. If today you cannot sing because your throat hurts or you don't have the heart for music, be silent. When the offering plate goes around, if you don't have the money to give or the heart to give, let it pass. Together we say, even this is enough. The world won't stop spinning on its axis if you don't rise to all occasions today. Love won't cease to flow in your direction, and your heart won't stop beating. All hope won't be lost. Together we say, even, even this, this is, is enough. enough. You are part of the plan for this world's sal salvation. Of that, I have no doubt. The world needs its oceans of people striving to be good, to be good to carry us to the shores of hope and wash fear from the beachheads and cleanse all wounds so that they can heal. Together we say, even this is enough. But oceans are big, and I am sure there are parts that don't feel up to the task of the whole some days. Rest, if you must then like the swimmer lying on their back who floats, or the hawk carried on cushions of air. Rest in pews made to hold weary lives in space carved out for the doing of nothing much more than just being. Together we say, even this is enough. Perhaps then you will feel in your bones, in your weary heart, the aching, healing sense that that is enough. Even this, that we are enough, that you are enough. Together we say, even, even this, this is, is enough. enough. And we light one more candle for the joys and sorrows held deeply in our, in our hearts. Together we say, even, Even this, this is, is enough. enough. Please join now in singing hymn number 168, One More Step.
our congregation is committed to creating a more compassionate world. To this end, each quarter we split our plate collection with an organization nominated by the people in the congregation and selected by our Give Away the Plate committee. Our first quarter plate recipient is Hope Through Soap, a remarkable nonprofit organization that provides a mobile outreach experience to the less fortunate facing homelessness and poverty. Hope Through Soap provides mobile showers, haircuts, hot food, and a mobile closet bus stocked with clothing and accessories and resources in various locations around the city of Atlanta, North Fulton County, Gwinnett County, and Forsyth County. Hope Through Soap offers more than just the basic needs of hygiene, clothing, and food, but along with it, a fun block party atmosphere that gives a sense of family, friendship, hope, and dignity. Our plate contributions also support the shared ministry of this congregation. So I ask that you please give generously to support the work of this important ministry in our wider community, as well as the vision and mission of the congregation. As we listen to our pianist, so grateful that you are here today, Brian, and Doug accompanying him, playing Dance Arab from The Nutcracker by Peter Illich Tchaikovsky. You will see on the screen ways to contribute to our offering via PayPal, Venmo, or by mailing a check payable to UUCG to the address shown. And if you are worshiping with us for the first time, your presence here today is a generous gift to this community. You may choose to let the plate pass. The offering will now be most gratefully received. Thank you. May the generous gifts received this week move us towards realizing our vision of a more connected and compassionate world. And thank you for that lovely music. Please join me in offering gratitude this morning. I'm very grateful for our worship associate, Joanne Weiss. I gave her several changes throughout the week, and she hung in there with me. Thank you. And to Brian Bishop for offering this wonderful music. It is so good to see you with his staff music mask. I love that. 
I want to thank Christiana McWayne and Aline Harris for helping me put the pieces of this morning's service together in a practical and loving way. I also emailed them repeatedly. Lots of changes. And I'm very blessed to have the help of Dan Kelly with the PowerPoint and video inclusions in this morning's slideshow, which came over at over one gigabyte of data. I'm also grateful, very grateful, for the tech team. Christiana McWayne served as our Zoom manager, and Justin Kelly, Justin Miller, Alexa, Alex, Alex, I apologize, let me try that again. Justin Miller, Alex Hebda, and Dan Kelly for our video and sound, which was, um, which was truly a task for them, and I appreciate their hard work. It is now time for our call to connection. Thank you all so much. Yes, now is the time for our call to connection within our congregation and beyond our walls. If you are new to our community, there are lots of ways to stay connected through email, through our website, through Facebook, through Twitter. Please explore these different options here and explore some of our upcoming programs and our calendar and our link and register also for events on our website. Would you like to watch past UUCG services? Well, we've got a YouTube channel for that and there's our address there. The first Sunday of each month, which happens to be today, we collect money or we collect food and other items for the Lawrenceville Cooperative Ministry. Uh, we are here from two until four right out in the driveway and you'll see a list of items that are currently needed by the Lawrenceville Cooperative Ministry. Engage your search for Truth and Meeting, exploring our faith development resources online for inspiration and information about our UU values and faith that goes beyond our Sunday mornings. And finally, check our news, our e-news, our UUCG website and calendar for other ways that you can stay connected. Um, all of these currently are meeting virtually, with the exception of the Covenant Choir, which is meeting on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. So lots of great things here that you can check out. Out of, um, we're running a little bit long this morning, and um, again, I thank everyone for helping me get past our, our difficulties with a lot of pieces of the puzzle to put together for the service today, and I'm also very grateful that the choir was here to sing. It meant the world to me. We are going to bypass our closing, our him 108 my life was on it and the song um we'll we'll pull it back in another service but to respect our time as we begin this excellent new year we're going to go straight to our extinguishing of the chalice followed by our closing words please please say with me the words as we extinguish the chalice we extinguish this flame but not the light of truth the warmth of communion or the fire of commitment these we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And our closing words this morning come to us from Scott Taylor, the daring of our intentions. May we dare to live from the center of our being. May we make our own choices before others' choices make us. May the fire that burns in our belly light our way. And may our collective intention make the world shine anew. May it be so.